This time I'd like to welcome all those folks who joined us on Facebook. Um, thank you for tuning in. This week we're beginning a brand new sermon series called Collide. Since the beginning, the Christian faith has been a, on a collision course with the culture around us. The values of this world do not align with the values of the Bible and what should be the values of our faith. The priorities of the world don't allow align with the priorities of our faith and the kingdom of man is not seeking the same things as the kingdom of God. So we shouldn't be surprised when we experience conflict and tension. Now, when I announced this um, topic and we did a little bit of uh, Facebook advertising, some folks imagined that this was going to be a political rally where we're going to stand against the evil left or whatever that is. And uh, that's not what this is. By the way, there's evil on the left and right side. Just so we're good and clear. If you want, if you want to find um, evil, just look at humanity. And it doesn't matter what political stripe you have or don't you'll find bad. And our culture is messed up no matter what your political leaning. But what we're going to look at is we're going to look at how God wants us to live in contrast to what is normal. We shouldn't be surprised when we in, experience that tension. But when we do experience that tension, it may be confirming that we're on the right track. You ever been out on a hike or a walk and you've gone through what you would call a, a rough patch? You know, the kind where every time you put your foot down, you're not sure if you're going to roll your ankle or if you're going to find solid ground. Like trying to walk through ice-covered snow. Any step could either put you forward one step or send you airborne, much to the delight of everyone around you. These types of perilous adventures are very much like walking through life depending on worldly wisdom, on the philosophy of this world, on the traditions of this world. You're never quite sure you're going to land on solid ground. And realistically, Principles and values are constantly shifting. Today, to try to be relevant in, in certain circles and certain areas can be very confusing because terms are in constant change of flux. I, um, I'm not going to 
get off in this too much, but I was uh, watching the, an advertisement for a, a conservative documentary called What is a Woman? And I was looking at a lot of the interviews and just simply asking that question in certain circles was making people very mad that you could ask such a bigoted and loaded question. How dare you speak like that? You are not an expert. What makes you an expert? Well, if I identify as a woman. But who can do that? That's not your problem. Wait, what? Things are in a constant state of flux. So where do we go? How can we navigate? The first thing that we need to do is to trust that God's word is right. Let me just step back. In this crazy world where truth seems to be in a constant state of flux, terms that you thought you knew now have new meanings. And you say, how can I navigate this? You can, again, going back to our old um, sermon series, you can drop your anchor. God's word is right. And we have a warning from the Apostle Paul today. We're going to get into this, second, or Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8 in just a second. I want to paint this up for you for a second. Paul was a missionary trying to reach people with the gospel. Paul... <coughs> <laughs> would definitely use certain cultures and traditions and be a little moldable to, to be able to reach each group within their uh, traditions and cultures and understanding so that they could get the gospel. There was a big movement to move those religiously trained Jews who are getting saved out from under the, the, the Jewish strict regimen and rhetoric and become more Greek, get further away from God's law and the, you know, and, and the Old Testament and just... And, Learn from all of these new thinking, the new philosophies, the enlightened folks. And Paul, who was not an intellectual slouch, set up a warning. And we read it today already. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8. Beware! Lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. You see, as we're witnessing the values of the world and the values of the kingdom of God collide, the warning rings out. Don't get caught up. Don't get spoiled. Don't get hooked in thinking, I don't want to get made fun of. I don't want to seem intellectually inferior. I want to be open-minded. 
Let me have my Bible open and the philosophy open and let me find where they meet. They don't throw philosophy out. Even when we choose to stand firm on the things of God, we're going to still be faced with the values of this world. I want you to think about this. It hits us everywhere. Now, our reaction should not be out of hatred or um, we should not reduce those outside the household of faith to a two-word epithet. So easy to do. We've had leadership to teach us how to do that. Listen, that's not how Christians do it. We react with truth, with grace, with love. But the first thing that we need to do we need to protect ourselves and realize worldly values are inconsistent. Look at verse 8. The Bible says, beware. That's the Greek word blepete, which means be constantly looking out. Keep a watchful eye, ever open. The form of this sentence, according to Lightfoot, is a measure of the imminence of peril. The Greek is, be ever on your guard, lest there shall be anyone who spoils you. Warren Wiersbe, one of my favorite uh, preachers and practical commentators, this. How is it possible for false teachers to capture people? The answer is simple. These captives are ignorant of the truths of the Word of God. They become fascinated by philosophy, empty delusion of the false teachers. That's not to say that all philosophy is wrong, but because there is a Christian philosophy of life, the word simply means to love wisdom. When a person does not know the doctrines of Christian faith, he can be captured by false religions. And when you compare false religions and false ideology and philosophy with the Bible, it's foolishness. Let me illustrate my point. Some mottos that we have heard, some that grace our Facebook feed, usually with little memes and dragonflies and unicorns and hearts, and, and of course this month, plenty of rainbows. Follow your heart. Do whatever makes you happy. Love is love. Sound good enough. The problem is they're inconsistent, shaky, really don't have any concrete meaning, and they contradict scripture. Follow your heart. Oh, you'll know when it's right. The heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? Don't follow your heart. You can. And you'll, you could say, well, I know in my heart. Now, here's the thing, too. Before we get all sanctimonious, 
you know, our Christian better than you kind of tood. Here's the way we Christians do it. I wouldn't be like those unsaved folks. Follow your heart. They got wicked hearts. But I got the Holy Spirit in my heart. So anything that my heart says, I know it's the Holy Spirit talking. So that's where we come up with weird stuff. You know? Um, and I was, I was doing a tongue-in-cheek thing this morning. But I was trying to... Uh, illustrate a point too during our our Sunday school time and by the way let me just give a quick commercial if you're missing Sunday school opening you are missing some fun brother Bobby came up with a fantastic game today and I like today's game but he's been doing another game called Bible Wordle and I don't like that game so I was saying today, completely tongue-in-cheek, but I was saying, well, I'm glad you got a good godly game this time instead of that ungodly wordle game last time. Wordle even sounds worldly. You know, and I was being tongue-in-cheek. But listen, you've heard preaching like that, and so have I. Somebody doesn't like something, taste-wise, so therefore we preach against it. Why? I can feel in my heart it's wrong. Why is it wrong? I don't like it. What's your stand on music? Well, I like, and I don't like. I didn't ask you what your taste was, but that's exactly what you told me. The heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked, who can know it? Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 39, He that finds his life shall lose it. He that loses his life for my sake shall find it. The world says you need to make sure that you're happy. No matter what. And now if we want to Christianize it, we say, it is God's will that you are happy. So someone said, well, I'm not happy with my wife. I'm going to divorce her. I believe it's God's will because I'm unhappy and God doesn't want me to be sad because he loves me. How do you know that to be true? I can feel it in my heart. We, how do we get there? Because you're eyeball deep in the warning that Paul's already set up. You've been blinded and seduced by the worldly philosophy that says, I want to feel good. It's God's will that I feel good. And it's all about me. Be honest for a moment. Can you build anything stable off of unstable principles? Like what your feelings are at the moment. Or changing definitions that change as society changes. We can't. That's why all the way back in the Gospels, we were warned. Therefore, whosoever hear the sayings of mine and doeth them shall be like unto a wise man. He built his house upon a rock. The rain descended. The floods came. The wind blew and beat upon the house. And it fell not. For it was founded upon a rock. Everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not 
shall be like unto a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Did you catch that? Jesus is commanding us to listen and obey his teaching. When we do, we'll be standing on a firm foundation. Worldly values are seductive or enticing. Paul warned preacher boy Timothy about these false teachers that are warned about here in our passage. And he talks about how slick their salesmanship is. Second Timothy chapter 4. Time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts, they will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Now, what in the world does that mean? Well, obviously, this is a metaphor of I got an itch that needs to be scratched. I have something I want someone to tell me. You ever look for counsel? You get counsel and not like it. So you keep looking. And uh, <coughs> you keep looking, keep asking, keep asking, keep asking. You keep getting the same stuff you don't like. Finally, you get someone to say what you wanted to hear. That's the wise counsel. Never mind the fact that the Bible says a multitude of counsel their safety. And you just had a multitude of counsel that you didn't like. And you ignored it until you could find some bonehead that agrees with you. They said they find they have itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. See, here's the thing. The reason why we need to beware of this philosophy, worldly philosophy, the vain deceit, is because inside of us, even those of us that are born again, there's a battle. There's a battle between the Holy Spirit and our flesh. Every one of us that is saved, we still have a flesh. We still have that Jeremiah 17, 9 heart that is desperately wicked. And so, there's this battle. And so we need to be careful because we can hear the stuff in the world and the stuff in the world will, will say stuff that's contradictory to Scripture, but you say, I like it. It sounds good. What a relief. Not any more of that old stuffy, fuddy-duddy stuff. But Paul warns us, the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. The Apostle Paul, and you don't get more, I don't think, more godly than the Apostle Paul. Here's a guy who wrote half the New Testament. The guy knew what it was to live a Christian life, yet he wrote... In Romans chapter 7, about this colossal battle that he would have with the flesh. We know that the law is spiritual. I am carnal, soul to understand. Wait, you can't be carnal. Paul, you're an apostle. Yes, I'm an apostle saved by grace with a carnal sin nature. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that I do not. What I hate, that I do. 
If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law. It is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Paul says, man, I struggle. I know what I ought to do, and sometimes I don't do it. So we need to understand that the worldly philosophy is seductive. And the devil can get us off hating one particular kind of sin that we don't struggle with. Meanwhile, completely blind to the seduction of falling in line with unbiblical thinking for another thing. Because it's colliding. What God wants for us, what our flesh wants, what the world grooms us to, they're on a collision course. But the Bible gives us a practical verse to kind of expose this mess. The thief cometh not but for to steal, kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life. They might have it more abundantly. What the devil can't fully destroy, he'll seek to distract. He'll steal your time, your treasure, and your attention. That's why we need to be plugged into Jesus. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him. The same bringing forth much fruit, for without him he can do nothing. Worldly values need to be exposed. How do we do that? We know that we have a wretched heart. We know that we're surrounded with wrong teaching. How do we light up, shine a light on, no, that's wrong? think differently. How do I do that? Two simple things. First of all, through the Word of God. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. This is a great passage. The Word of God is quick, means it's alive. It's powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and the joints of the marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Now, I want you to think about this. You are constantly being bombarded with worldly values. And it's subtle. It could be through the music you listen to. It could be through um, just Facebook memes or... Instagram, or social media. It could be television shows. It could be conversations with either carnal or unsafe folks. And the philosophy just keeps coming, keeps coming, keeps going. You got to pay attention to you. You got to love you before you can love anybody else. You got to forgive yourself before you can forgive anybody else. You listen, you got to pay attention to you. Nobody else is going to pay attention to you. Listen, you are a flawed human being. You will pay attention to yourself just fine. But you have all this stuff. Keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. How do you expose it? The Word of God. Where do I look in the Bible, Pastor? Everywhere. Meaning, get yourself, if you're not there, get yourself on a regular Bible reading schedule. Um, we have our Bible reading challenge. We're halfway through it. And uh, there are Bible reading challenge schedules on the back uh, table. If you haven't done it, just grab it and start. You say, yeah, but I'm halfway through the year. It's all good. The deal is to immerse yourself in Scripture all the time. Every day a little. Every day something. 
Um, I know of folks that the way they do it, because you know, you, we have a, a life that is busy. Man, I don't have time to read. Yeah, but you're driving for a half hour. What are you doing? Well, I listen to the news. Have a better idea. Immerse yourself and your mind in the Word. And guess what? Then you can run every idea and opinion through the filter of God's Word. And it'll be amazing how the Word of God that quick, sharp, powerful word of God that is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. There'll be something in your reading that will say, ah, see that? That's not me. That's not where you ought to be. Oh, boy, I'm glad I read that. See, see how that works? Through the word of God. And through the Spirit of God. If you're a born-again believer, you have the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's living inside of you. As you read the Word of God, the Holy Spirit works with the Word of God and moves and teaches and guides and convicts and empowers. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. And now we know on this side of Calvary that he is. The Apostle Paul says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. There it is. The Holy Spirit says, this is what you need to do. The flesh says, no, I'll do this. How do I follow the Spirit? Do that. Why? Because that's what the Spirit said. How do I know? Because that's what the Word of God says. Oh, then I'll do this. And guess what? If I'm following the Spirit, I'm not doing that. I'm not following the flesh. It's that simple. J.I. Packer wrote, All Christians are at once beneficiaries of and victims of tradition. Beneficiaries who received nurturing truth and wisdom from God's faithfulness in the past generations and victims who now take for granted things that need to be questioned, thus treating as divine absolutes patterns of belief, personal behavior that should be seen as human and provisional and relative. We're all beneficiaries of good, wise, and sound tradition and victims of poor, unwise, unsound tradition. So it takes devotion and effort to learn and to walk in step with the Spirit as you follow the teaching of Scripture. There will always be temptations to veer off the path, to go adventuring through the rough patches without any guidance. The abundant life is found in the kingdom of God, grounded in the word of God, empowered by the spirit of God. The world's trying to draw you into its values, inconsistent, seductive, and at worst, destructive. But today, as we begin this new series, we have the opportunity to invite the spirit of God to Guide us into scriptural truth. And then to remain firm. Thank you, Lord, for these truths. Help us, God, to stand for you, to do what's right, to expose where we've been wrong, and to make different choices. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.